Support for sustainability defined comes from NLX, the makers of Juicebox, the best selling electric car home charging station. The Juicebox smart charger enables EV drivers to charge their cars with the cleanest and cheapest energy available. More online at juiceboxstore.com. All right, listeners, welcome back to Sustainability Defined, where Scott and I are here defining sustainability one concept and one bad joke at a time. This is episode 46, our 2019 holiday hodgepodge with sustainable gift ideas, top articles, and other fun goodies. Scott, we're feeling festive. It's everyone's favorite time of year, Jay. Oh, God. We're, hodgepodge time. We're recording in our, <laughs> our holiday jammies curled up by the fire with hot cocoa. It's just so, so great. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. All right, Jay. So let's give the listeners a sense of what we're going to do on this hodgepodge. Variety of things. We're going to do a year in review explaining what we've done on the podcast. We're going to give career updates because, Jay, you and I both have new jobs. That's right. We're going to talk about our favorite articles from the year. We're going to give those sustainable gift ideas that we give every year. And then we're going to do an interview with two special guests, Samantha Birch and Annabelle Mercer from Duke University, who helped us with some marketing. And then we're going to give thanks to the many important folks that make this podcast possible. It's not just Jay and I. There's quite a number of hands behind the scenes. Absolutely. And Jay, I think one thing we want to remind people is that in our episodes, make sure to listen all the way through. Jay provides a bad joke after (laughs) the interview and sometimes a sponsorship. And that then brings us into, yes, some thank yous, but we also give updates to you. We ask certain things of the listeners. So there's actually a lot of important updates towards the end. So keep on listening all the way through uh, normally when listening to an episode. All right, Scott, let's move into our year in review, starting with our favorite episodes from this year. So when I say favorite episode, what comes to mind for you? So Jay, to me, I really like the university sustainability episode. I like that we deviated from our typical framework of one expert interview, and we had the sustainability lead at Penn State University, but we also had a professor that had incorporated some of our podcast episodes in her class. And then we interviewed actual students who were in that class about their engagement with the podcast. So I really liked that episode. Actual students who claim to have actually laughed at some of the jokes, <laughs> which, is, you can believe it. which is why they got such good credit on their, on their grades. Uh, Scott, I would say mine was climate advocacy for a couple reasons. Number one, it's a topic that so many of us want to get involved with. And then number two, Varshini Prakash, who's the executive director of the Sunrise Movement, her story about how they created that to be so successful as a result of intensively studying what made other historical movements successful in the past was super interesting. Mm -hmm. And that's a good fact on its own, but let's talk favorite facts from the year, Jay. So in our high-speed rail episode, one thing we learned was that China has more high-speed rail than the rest of the world combined, and they've done a lot of that like in the past decade. So that blew my mind that they have that much high-speed rail. Let let that be a lesson to any small country that wants to really up its high-speed rail game. China has done it so quickly, although... Of course, it might be its own example, but yeah, China's not a small <laughs> let's move on. So, Scott, I would say, you know, of course, being in the real estate and, and urban planning side, I love the fact that the U.S.'s households and commercial buildings together account for 41 percent of total U.S. energy usage, which means that these buildings consume more energy than the transportation and the industry sectors, which was mind boggling to wrap my mind around. Because transportation industry, pretty big sectors. And Jay, this was part of our energy efficiency episode that we did toward the beginning of the year. Exactly, Scott. All right. So listeners, we're now at 200,000 total downloads, which is really also pretty cool. We're now averaging just over 10,000 downloads per month, which is up from 6,000 downloads per month this time last year and 1,500 downloads the year before that. So... As a part of that, thank you listeners for helping us spread the good word. Right. And the key way, Jay, I think, for listeners to help us out in spreading the word is to leave an iTunes review if you have not already. You can do it in the podcast app. It's very easy. 
and we're up to 122 iTunes review. That's double where we were last year. This is fantastic stuff, but we don't want to stop here. So, listeners, please take the time to rate and review us. It helps people find the show because the more reviews we have, the more we show up when people search for new content. Jay, we like to think this could be the listener's holiday gift to us. You don't even need to wrap it. (laughs) And it's free. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So here's a review from Josh Christ left in the last month because, Jay, we read them personally, but we like to pick ones and you can get featured on the show. So Josh Christ, he said, If you are at all interested in really understanding the multi-layered and complex world of sustainability, this is a podcast you won't want to miss. Jay and Scott combine an incredible mix of humor, research, and compelling guest interviews to make sustainability fun to learn about and easy to understand. Highly recommend listening, subscribing, and becoming part of this community. Josh Christ. Aw. Josh, thank you. And I love how he calls it a community because it really is. you know. And I know we're going to talk with Annabelle and Samantha later about how we're trying to make that happen via social media and other things. But I love that that's how at least Josh sees it because we certainly see it that way. Yeah, really cool. Because, Scott, you know, we can't see our listeners when we're recording this, but it's nice to know that there is a real community that's forming. Mm Mm-hmm. Also, so I I just find this hilarious. So folks who listened to our last episode on sustainable aquaculture will recall us asking if there's anyone out there that likes fish and dislikes salmon at the same time. And this was too big of a cliffhanger just to leave, right? So we thought, Scott, if you recall, that it would be far more common to dislike fish generally, but still like salmon as opposed to the other way around. Well, it turns out one of you exists. So... Shout out to Sam H for his unique fish preferences. Sam is the chief sustainability officer and co-founder of Circle Compost based in Philadelphia. Well, as my girlfriend likes to say, Sam is a special snowflake for those sort of (laughs) likes and dislikes there on the fish side. Okay, let's get into career updates now because Jay, you and I have new jobs to share. And we also know that a number of our listeners are thinking about how to break into this industry and get maybe a different job within sustainability. We're planning on doing an episode focused on careers in sustainability sometime in 2020, so keep an eye out for that. So Jay, tell the listeners about your awesome new job. Right, so Scott, this has been a little bit of a journey. So those (laughs) of you that have been listening over the past year may recall my sustainability-oriented travels through Europe. It exposed me to all kinds of facets of sustainability, both across industries and across the globe. But Scott, probably some other things too. I would think a, a few other things, a, a good number of pints out there in London. But mm-hmm. but Scott, at the end of the day, bringing this full circle, I was ready to move back to Denver and get back to my urban planning and real estate roots in my hometown. So back in Denver, I eventually landed my current role at StoryBuilt, which is a real estate developer that builds urban infill, transit oriented projects. This means that we repurpose and redevelop existing urban land parcels as opposed to developing out in the suburbs and contributing to urban sprawl side plug for my LinkedIn article on how urban sprawl happens. So at Storybuilt, I'm responsible for acquiring and developing new land parcels in exciting neighborhoods around town. I'm also helping Storybuilt develop its overall sustainability strategy for the company with regards to how we embed sustainability in our operations and in our investment strategy. So the company is based in Austin. I'm helping launch the new Denver office. And again, Scott, this came full circle. I get to use my master's in urban planning and real estate and also my expertise that we've gained here on the podcast in sustainability. It's a really exciting time. Yeah, I hadn't heard the term urban infill, Jay. So that just means like filling in the urban areas that maybe aren't utilized to their full potential. Exactly. So it's it's okay. essentially prioritizing areas that are closer to downtowns where you have more things like existing bus lines and public transit options, as opposed to what are called green fields, which is kind of the opposite, like you know, the, the field of grass that you're building something very new on. Yeah. And I would think the developments themselves when they're done would be more valuable because they're in the thick of it. Scott, are you looking for a job at Storybuilt? We, we, might, be able to, <laughs> we might be able to use you. Uh, but, yeah, yeah, fair enough. But uh, actually, before we try to hire you here, tell us about your new role. Okay, well, Jay, I must say that I am loving my new role, so you're going to have to make quite the offer. (laughs) I am the VP of Sustainability at the Can Manufacturers Institute now. So CMI is the National Trade Association of the Metal and Composite Can Manufacturing Industry Mm -hmm. and its suppliers in the United States. So in short, 
CMI represents the producers of all those wonderful, infinitely recyclable uh, food cans, beverage cans, and aerosol cans that I'm sure so many listeners enjoy. So I have three tasks at CMI. One is communications. My job is to promote the can as a sustainable circular package and spread the word about how it has this high recycling rate and how most cans get turned into new cans. And certainly my experience on the podcast helps taking complex ideas and making them intriguing and that people spread the word on them. Second is policy. So part of my role is to follow the policy developments at the state and federal level to make sure the can is not disadvantaged. And what's great, Jay, is I get to wear my lawyer hat again. So kind of going full circle on things for me too. You, you do look and good third, in that lawyer hat, Scott. Oh, it, it, it fits nice. And then the third is strategy. So I was asked to determine who the industry should collaborate with and what it should do to increase the recycling rate of cans that's already the highest recycling rate of all beverage containers. And leading the Beyond 34 Recycling Initiative in my last job gave me the contacts and experience that I needed to make this happen. So my graduate degrees, hosting this podcast, my previous roles, all prepared me for this dream position, and I'm still in D.C., so you know this, this part of my life has just been a wealth of good things this year, so I'm very appreciative of that. Scott, let us cheers our hot cocoa mugs. Mm, clink. Oh, no, my marshmallows <laughs> fell out. Oh, we cheers too hard. <laughs> oh, boy. All right, so so moving away from from marshmallows and on to our favorite articles from this year. So listeners, note that like all of our other episodes, we're going to have the show notes up for this one too, and we'll have links to all of the articles that we're going to discuss there if you'd like to read more. So Scott, start us off. What are your favorites from 2019? All right, so Jay, to figure these out, what I did is I actually looked back at my LinkedIn posts because... On Mondays every week, I post about sustainability. Every Wednesday, I post about recycling. Friday, I post about something I'm up to. So there were a lot of good articles on there. And one that I posted about was from February 2019. There was a New York Times article about how the Senate passed a 92 to 8. Jay, did you get that? 92 to 8 in today's political climate. A sweeping public lands conservation bill. Hard to believe. President, That's great. I know. President Trump signed it. It created more than a million acres of new wilderness protected a million acres of public lands from future mining, created 2,600 miles of new national trails, and so much more. Few things warm my heart more than bipartisanship and protecting public spaces that now belong to all of us to enjoy. So we can be proud of our lawmakers for passing yeah, that. Yeah, th- thank God for something we're proud of, right, coming out of, out of your neighborhood, Scott. So that's a great one. I know. Yeah. Number two is on the social side. So there was an NPR article, uh, also from February 2019, explaining how New Orleans went from an explosion in homelessness after Hurricane Katrina to reducing its homelessness population 90%. How did it do this? A threefold strategy. One was organizing an outreach team to engage the homeless wherever they were. Second was establishing a rent assistance fund with the help of Congress. And third was taking a housing first approach where you house people as they are, think sober or not, and then provide the services necessary to keep them stable and live higher quality lives. So not just the housing, but the social services they need. So not just the housing, Jay, but also the social services that those people need. Right. And Scott, this this parallels really nicely with episode 41, which was equity in cities, where we spoke with the chief sustainability officers of both the city of Denver and the city of Charlotte. So listeners, if you're interested in this theme, all kinds of great stuff to unpack there. Nice plug, Jay. Thank you, Scott. Mm -hmm. So to wrap up my favorite articles, I got a couple on food waste and food loss, and then one on recycling. So there were two reports on food loss. People might remember from our food waste episode that food loss refers to food that is lost in the supply chain where they're creating edible food for humans. Food waste is after it's already in its form that humans would buy it. So... The first report on food loss comes from World Wildlife Fund. It's called No Food Left Behind Part 2, and it looks at the amount of loss at the farm for certain processing crops. So the loss varied by crop, but some of them blew my mind. They saw rates as high as 50% in there for leafy greens, Jay. 50%. Yeah, that that truly is mind-blowing. Not not something we like to hear. No. And then there's a Santa Clara University study looking at on-farm food loss more generally And it found a whopping one-third of edible produce remains unharvested in the fields. So why does this happen? 
Well, there's a number of them, but two reasons are that farmers, they often plant 25 to 30% more than what they need to ensure that they can satisfy a contract. The other is that labor is expensive. Farmers ask their workers to focus on just picking the best produce. And Scott, this is one of those instances where we have kind of business strategy that might not be leading to the most optimal outputs, but at the same time, great opportunities for these new types of companies to come in, you know, for example, like Misfit Foods that we spoke with way back when to help fix some of this stuff. Yeah. And it's like, I get why they're doing it, but we have to have entrepreneurs and others come in with solutions to help them capture this food in a cost-effective way. Yeah. So next, uh, to wrap up, a couple articles on recycling. One is a Builder Online article from April 2019 looking at recycling for construction and debris waste. I feel like this is not a thing people think about often because they're really thinking about recycling at home, but there's a lot of this CND waste. Building construction generated 169 million tons of waste in 2015. Another is a Vice News video from July 2019. It shows how Moscow has 12 million people and no recycling system. I had no idea. Mm -hmm. And that's 10 million tons of waste a year that ends up overflowing in landfills They create fumes leading to negative health effects downwind. The government's plan? Simply ship the waste further away to a new landfill, 800 miles outside the city, to a currently pristine stretch of swamp and forest. This swamp is a source of 140 streams. There are protesters that are organizing this proposed landfill site. The government's clashing with them. Last I read, the new landfill was suspended but not canceled. So it's kind of sad that they're like, well... We have this waste issue. Our landfills are overflowing. Let's just make a new one further away rather than addressing the fundamentals of their system. Exactly. I couldn't have put it any better, Scott. That was so articulate. Well, thank you, Jay. That is very – what compliments coming out of this episode. Mm. Love it. Uh, so, Jay, tell the listeners about your favorite articles of the year. Right. So, Scott, I'll start this by saying that it's easy for – us as sustainability aficionados to get overburdened by personal choices and individual actions in pursuit of a healthy environment, especially for an issue of this unprecedented magnitude. So I think we can all relate to the stress that we put on ourselves to choose the right reusable container or avoid single use products. All these things we're probably well familiar with, but I think too much guilt can actually be a little counterproductive. So Scott, I liked the articles I'm going to share this year because they helped round out and challenge my perspective over and above the things I'm already doing in my daily life to live more sustainably. So here's the heads up. They can sound a little heavy, but we'll we'll break them apart. Okay. Number one is called, quote, I work in the environmental movement. I don't care if you recycle, written by Mary Inez Hegler. The subheader is stop obsessing over your environmental, quote, sins, fight the oil and gas industry instead. So Hegler's position is that much of our public energy towards sustainability has been intentionally misled over the years by special interests. She rejects the narrative that, quote, climate change could have been fixed if we'd all just ordered less takeout, used fewer plastic bags, turned off more lights, etc. Instead, she encourages us to focus our energies on government and industry so that we're not sweeping leaves on a windy day, which I think is a fantastic analogy, She suggests getting politically active to magnify our environmental efforts and not let special interests off the hook. So, Scott, with this article, you know, we don't want to minimize the importance of individual action here. And certainly individual action around political involvement is huge. But for me, this article helped remind me to not overly sweat the small stuff and lose sight of the forest for the trees. You know, it's okay if we have to use some takeout containers if we're usually pretty good otherwise. Plus, I think Hegler's reminder that this year is a major election year is is pretty convenient. Right. So, I I mean, to me, Jay, this is, I'm glad you're sharing articles that challenge your perspective. It sounds like this author saying, what's the biggest bang for your time? Mm -hmm. And you obsessing over, oh, I didn't, I shouldn't have used that takeout container. I should have brought my own reusable one. Like, if you would have taken that couple minutes to sign a petition, that probably wouldn't be better than just hemming and hawing in your own head. And I get that. But I do think that it is important to recycle, that you do those things that you can feel like you're really making a difference on that individual level, because I feel like it is a gateway to these bigger actions. Right. And actually, without disclosing too much of the article to listeners, she has this great analogy where she's sitting at a dinner table and someone hears that she's involved in the environmental movement and then starts kind of 
almost confessing all of this person's sins, like throwing away certain things. And, and her point is, look, just because we're interested in sustainability and want to push it forward, it shouldn't fall on our shoulders to essentially almost bear the burden of all this stuff and that we need to keep everything in perspective on top of our individual actions and, and recycling, of course, to help move this forward in the most effective way. Mm-hmm. All right. What's number two? So, Scott, number two, I will say, is admittedly a little heavier. Even heavier. Even heavier. So, listeners, uh, happy holidays and buckle up. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's called, it's called, quote, What If We Stopped Pretending by Jonathan Franzen. Now, this article actually got a lot of flack from big time climate leaders. But listeners, if you're not aware of this article's reactions yet, I'd suggest you read it first, see what you think, and then see what others had to say about it. So in a nutshell, the article's core premise is that we might be better off by accepting the inevitability of climate change. Franzen details a number of reasons as to why he believes The crisis is unavoidable and it might sound pessimistic and many folks might disagree with his position and I take issue with a number of parts as well, but I think he ultimately distills his argument into a proactive and weirdly encouraging message. All right. So, so bear with us and and listen to this excerpt quote, all that war on climate change made sense only as long as it was winnable. Once you accept that we've lost it, other kinds of action take on greater meaning. In this respect, any movement towards a more just and civil society can now be considered a meaningful climate action. It's a really interesting spin. So he goes on to list examples like securing fair elections, combating extreme wealth inequality, shutting down hate machines on social media and supporting the free press, among others, as meaningful climate actions. So zooming out, Scott, I like the way this article connects climate change to every aspect of our lives since this is truly an issue that touches everything. I kind of doubt many of us are as nihilistic as Franzen is, but I enjoyed the way this article encouraged me to really think critically about how our society could and should function in a warming world. You know, I know it's a lot to think on listeners, but I'd encourage you to read it and see what you think and, and maybe challenge your, your perspective a little bit. I will say, Jay, this kind of reminds me of the first article you mentioned because it's saying... Don't get caught up with fighting climate change and diverting your attention from these other really important things. Just like the first article was saying, don't get caught up worrying about all these little individual actions and not focusing on the biggest bang for your time. So I get it, and that is important, but in a world where, as we said, I think in our climate change communication episode, that one in 10 people know that more than like 98% of scientists say climate change is happening and it's due to humans, we do still need to have this war on climate and making sure that people understand it. Uh, but certainly it shouldn't come at the expense of the other things you mentioned. Yeah, I think it's it's it was a good way to take ourselves out of, of our sustainability spheres that both of us are so entrenched in. And think about that, unfortunately, we're kind of the minority when it comes to those that are pushing the urgency of this stuff. So mm-hmm. again, to your point, I mean, we you know by no means do we want to minimize individual action or recycling recycling cans of course but oh, again yes. just so important so important but but again i thought these were just very interesting ways to think about and, and ultimately become a little bit more firm and, and hopefully strong in your sustainability passions all right jay i think we need to go beyond the heavy articles and do gift ideas Woo! <laughs> Woo! okay so first of all disclaimer no one paid for us to join this list. We just Googled around with the help of some volunteers and picked out ones we thought were cool. So we're not getting any kickback. We didn't get any of these for free or any of that. So, Right. Important disclaimer, Scott. So, so Jay, start with number one. Right. Number one is called Companion, which is spelled C-U-P-A-N-I-O-N. This is a company that sells high quality reusable water bottles that gives water to those in need every time you fill up what they call fill it forward. What put this over the top for us to include in this list is that you don't even have to buy a whole water bottle to partake. You can buy a sticker for five bucks, slap that on your bottle and take part in fill it forward all the same. You scan the barcode on the sticker via their app to record your water refill and generate the donation automatically. Learn more at companion.com. I thought this was going to be like a Wilson volleyball situation where a cup is now your companion, but 
this works too. Do you, do you think Tom Hanks would have made as, as good of friends with a cup as he would have with a volleyball? I think he just, he needed somebody. He was in a bit, he was in a tough spot. <laughs> didn't, didn't matter the object. <laughs> no. Okay. So number two is the Be Mind gift bundle. We saw this on greenheartshop.org. This is a website devoted to sourcing products and curating a collection where all of the products are fair trade, eco-friendly, or have a social mission. In this Be Mind gift bundle, there's three ounces of honey and a wooden honey dipper. The wooden honey dipper was made in Tunisia by Le Souk, which has long-term relationships with producers and pays them more than fair trade requires. The honey was made by Bee Love, which is located in Chicago and gives men and women returning from incarceration a stable work history, marketable skills, and the confidence needed to re-enter the workforce. This whole bundle, Jay, only 15 bucks. And this could be a cute Valentine's Day gift too. Just kind of knock that out. All right, Scott, real quick. Do we think our girlfriends are listening? <laughs> yeah, I think we we can't do this because we just wouldn't get the same points. But our listeners, they can get points. <laughs> okay, Botanium is another one. This is a self-watering planter that enables you to grow herbs and veggies with soilless growing technology. I need this, Jay, because I have tried to grow herbs. It's not working for me. I would love to have a self-watering thing. It was designed in Sweden with its classic minimalism design so you can plant the seed, plug it in, and leave it alone for weeks. How does it do this? With hydroponic technology. There's a porous medium that retains air as well as moisture. This is a great environment for roots to grow in. And what can you grow in botanium? Well, herbs and lettuce like basil and spinach, and also vegetables like cherry tomatoes and eggplant. You can buy a botanium for 69 euros. It is European based, about seven, that's $76 plus shipping. And it includes everything but the seeds. You can learn more at botanium, B O T A N I U M dot S E. Scott, did you know that over in the UK, they pronounce the H in herbs to say herbs? Oh, yeah. I, yeah. I, I, and I love so many little UK turns of phrase. Right? That one, car park. That one threw me off, but lift. Yeah. Right. Brilliant. Actually, speaking of brilliant. Brilliant. Nice. (laughs) Wow. So next up, we have Brilliant Earth, which is the global leader in ethically sourced jewelry and that company you see advertising all over LinkedIn and Facebook. So Mm -hmm. it has what it's called Beyond Conflict-Free Diamonds. These are diamonds that have been sourced for their ethical and environmentally responsible origins. The company donates 5% of net profit to help build a brighter future in mining communities in the communities the company operates and beyond. What sold us on including brilliant earth here is its use of recycled precious metals such as silver, gold, platinum, and palladium. Examples of its recycled metal sources are existing jewelry, industrial use metals, and electronics components. This means the negative social and environmental impact that too often occurs with mining and especially gold mining is voided. I mean, get this, it takes 20 tons of ore to produce enough gold to make a single ring. Meanwhile... Jay, that's like a party shaming fact. Yeah, do you... Someone wearing... Do you want someone to drop their drink and immediately leave the party? Yeah. That's your fact. But, Scott, this is really cool. We saw a lot of beautiful recycled gold rings in hundreds of dollars on the site that, again, are are conflict-free. So learn more at brilliantearth.com. Yeah, I have to say, Joe, I don't... I don't really know what palladium is. <laughs> Do you know? Palladium? 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 I can't say I, I do. All right, listeners. Well, maybe avoid that one. <laughs> <laughs> the recipient would be like, thanks for this mystery uh, metal. <laughs> Next up, Scott, we have the Ethical Silk Company. First of all, the question is, is silk production not ethical? Well, one issue with it is that silk production requires the killing of mulberry silkworm larvae, which, Scott, we've been protesting for a long time. Oh, yeah. We've been right on the picket lines with the other larvae. Yeah. (laughs) This company solves for that, utilizing a mulberry silk production system that extracts silk from the cocoon after the moth has left its cocoon. It's more like a fine linen than the shiny finish of traditional silk. In addition to that, Ethical Silk Company's products are tailored and printed by hand at a fair trade tailor in Jaipur, India. It donates 5% of profits to an aid center in India and 5% of profits to an organization addressing homelessness in Ireland, really spanning the globe there. 
And Scott, on top of that, it's dyes are low impact and all water used is treated and recycled. So the pajamas we found are pretty expensive at a little under 300 bucks, but the eye mask they have is at a much lower price point of 35 bucks. Check it out at the ethical silk company.com. Yeah. I respect how that company gives so much of its profits to important causes. I feel like a couple products we've highlighted here, Jay do that. And also some of the products, it's not just about the product itself, but how it was made, who made it. So there's a lot that goes into this, huh? Oh, yeah, a lot of companies are really starting to look well beyond their own operations, which is is a really cool trend to see. Also, eye mask critical for all travel. So absolutely, silk eye okay. masks at that. What well, silk eye masks? Yeah, if you travel in luxury. <laughs> so last, Jay, let's talk about gifts where you don't actually give a physical thing. Heifer International is a nonprofit that gives animals to families in need. So these animals can provide the families with wool, milk, eggs, and more. It works in 21 countries around the world to strengthen local economies and build secure livelihoods that guarantee a living income to local farmers. This charity has actually been operating since 1944 and has brought 34 million families out of poverty. It's pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. These animals provide benefits to these families for years. You don't have to give a whole animal. You can give a share. For example, a full goat is $120. We can give a share of a goat for $10. You can also give a full heifer for $500. Apparently heifers, more valuable than goats. Or a share of a heifer for $50. They do have a whole gift catalog you can check out. We also encourage you to check out their website, heifer.org. That's H-E-I-F-E-R.org. To check out their work in a variety of areas, including economic empowerment, women's empowerment, environmental sustainability, risk mitigation, and food security and nutrition. Scott, I got to say this works out very well because I know on your holiday list, you had socks, boxers, and a goat. So (laughs) we can make sure we get that for you. And on top of that, listeners, for those of you that are listening, like I am, a heifer is defined as a young female cow that has not yet born a calf. So Scott, I don't know if that was on your list, but you know, listeners maybe consider that for him too. Wow. Now people can impress others with their heifer knowledge. (laughs) Nice. All right, Scott, there's also the option to give the gift of offsets. Two companies have made it easy to buy personal offsets, one in plastic and one in carbon. The plastic one is Repurpose. Its website, repurpose.global, helps you calculate your impact, offset your unique footprint, and get green living tips tailored just for you. It charges 25 cents per pound for the offset. So for example, if you use between 12 to 20 pounds of plastic per month, like the typical person, that equates to about three to five bucks per month. You choose the organization you want your money to go to, and you receive at the beginning of every month, real-time tracking of both your social and environmental impact. Things like volume recycled, type of plastic, workers impacted, et cetera. It takes your donation then to its certified partners around the world that, for example, divert waste from landfills with cradle-to-cradle production models and provide technology that enables ethical sourcing of plastic waste from the information sector. I feel like this is a pretty new thing, huh? These plastic offsets and measuring your plastic footprint. We typically hear about it in carbon, which is the last thing we want to talk about. So a carbon offset provider is TerraPass. And you could just buy enough to offset what it says the average amount that a U.S. citizen produces. That's 3,000 pounds of CO2 emissions per month. A gift of one month of offsets is $15. And a gift of one year is about 180. The money given to TerraPass gets distributed to various projects, including landfill gas capture, anaerobic digesters on farms to convert methane to energy, and methane capture at abandoned coal mines. So people that want to give offsets to their friends and family or for themselves, I think, Jay, these are two pretty good options. All right, Scott, let's transition now before we move over to our interview portion of this episode and introduce Samantha Birch and Annabelle Mercer. So earlier this year, we were blessed by two strategic marketing powerhouses, Samantha and Annabelle. They joined us from Duke University's Master of Environmental Management program, and helped us completely redefine our marketing strategy. Marketing defined, right? Marketing defined. Look out Look out for the new spinoff podcast <laughs> yeah, coming exactly. soon this spring. <laughs> so Samantha and Annabelle set quite 
an ambitious agenda right from the start. Specifically, they helped us define our messaging and branding guidelines, develop our target audience profiles, communication strategy, content map, and sponsorship management plan, and set operational frameworks to keep their work intact long after they move on to their next roles. Annabelle and Samantha were sharp, organized, results-driven, right, Jay, from the start? Oh, yeah. Uh, Plus, they even laughed at our bad jokes from the start, which, you know, we don't limit that to the podcast, although we do save our best ones, right, Jay, for the listeners? (laughs) Try to. And they joined us to reflect on their work over the last several months. So, Jay, let's move into our conversation with them and hear more about their awesome work and some of their insights on marketing that the listeners can apply in their own work and lives. All right. Support for Sustainability Defined comes from NLX, the makers of Juicebox, the best-selling electric car home charging station. The Juicebox can charge an EV up to 13 times faster than other home charging stations. Juicebox's smart charging Wi-Fi features also help drivers charge with the cheapest and cleanest energy available. Schedule car charging when electricity rates are lower or with JuiceNet Green software, charge with the cleanest energy on the grid. Sync your EV charging to times when solar and wind power are at maximum production and fossil fuel power sources are at a minimum. More online at juiceboxstore.com. All right, listeners, we are now joined by Samantha Birch and Annabelle Mercer. They are students in Duke University's Master of Environmental Management program, pursuing the business and environment concentration. They've been helping us, as we mentioned earlier, immensely with all of our marketing strategies. But first off, Samantha and Annabelle, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having us. It's great to be here. We're excited. So you've been behind the scenes. Now we finally get to get you out in front and tell the world how you've been helping us. But first, for some context, what drew you to the podcast as your graduate project while at Duke in the first place? And then, of course, the follow-up question is, did you have any idea that the jokes would be this bad? <laughs> um, well, the jokes the jokes are gold, first of all. <laughs> <laughs> is that a quote? Can we use that on, as a testimonial? Um, I can actually say that because as someone who's been tuning into your podcast, uh, since, well, 2016, that, that's a lot of... Wow. I didn't know it went back that far. Yeah, it, yeah, you guys have been She's around. Been We've been at this for <laughs> too long, Scott. <laughs> big, big fan. Started listening to you guys way back then. How did you discover the podcast? Yeah, so I, I was actually working in international higher education at the time, and I wanted to go back to school for all things sustainability, but specifically focus on the private sector. And I was like, I really need to, I really need to figure out what's going on in the environmental field. Uh, so I started to look up sustainability podcasts, and you guys popped up. Um, so fast forward to to grad school, and one day our environmental marketing professor Skyped Jay in after following you guys since 2016. So this is spring of 2019. Mm-hmm. Needless to say, I was uh, starstruck. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, flattery <laughs> off the bat pretty pumped to meet um you know one of the guys behind sustainability define that mm-hmm. i'd been following for quite some time so when our professor asked if you wanted to be involved samantha my hand shot up um we were really really excited um one of the things we talk about a lot in our program is the complexity of sustainability and because it's such a dynamic challenge that it really, it's constantly changing and it's hard to talk about, it's hard to address. So I was super drawn to the project just because of the mission of the podcast Mm -hmm. of spreading the word of sustainability and making it approachable and something that's more easily tackled. Well, that's great. And we certainly appreciate all the time and effort you've put into it. So tell us about what you suggested we do in terms of social media. Like, why is that such an important area to focus on? How can we leverage that? I think it's really important to, to talk about that. And I think uh, the first thing to point out is where the industry is going. I mean, our first step was just understanding what the market trend piece of this was and, and seeing that the podcast industry is growing at this insane pace. I mean, by 2020, it's projected to be close to a $700 million market. 
And then also, I guess more important than those revenue drivers is sustainability defines mission to help educate the public and understanding that not enough people know about all of this, this cool stuff, honestly. I mean, I think there's an untapped consumer base. And so, so all of that said, social media is definitely a critical way to, to actually share these facts about sustainability. It's key to helping build brand awareness and a community of followers. So all of you awesome <laughs> listeners out there. I mean, for instance, 60% of Instagram users say that they find new services and products on Instagram itself. And then 71%, another fun fact, of consumers who've had a good social media experience with a brand are actually likely to recommend it to others. So in order to, to share the message and, and for sustainability to find to continue to be thought leaders in this space, it was really important for us to, to look at all of these different options for you know, improving and increasing sustainability defines use in social media. So going off of social, which as you were describing is so important because so often it can be someone's first or second impression of, of the podcast operation. On top of social media, one of our favorite pieces of your work is our core competency map. So this is a map that lays out what makes us unique as a sustainability podcast. So it was super interesting for me and Scott to think of our episodes essentially as products that provide a real service to the listener that your map really helped us understand. So could you describe this map to us and the listeners and tell us about how your research helped create it? Yeah, definitely. The core competency map is a great, great marketing tool. Um, it's a framework we used to visually kind of structure the core skills and the market value of the podcast. Um, so for the listeners, the core competency map is kind of an upside down flow chart, um, starting from the base and moving up. And so at the base, we have Jay and Scott's core competencies, core skills, which we, Samantha and I identified as compiling research, building relationships with your sectors of expertise, and developing engaging content. So in other words, the bad jokes. <laughs> I thought she was gonna say like making scrambled eggs. <laughs> like... <laughs> Core competency, horrible humor. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> but those guys... <laughs> Sorry, I'm well. losing it. <laughs> um, so those skills kind of all come together to allow you to create the services you provide, which are the research back content and then the interviews with the leading experts. And so these services make up your core product, which is, of course, the actual podcast itself. And then at the top of the core competency map, we have the market impacts of this podcast. And this is educated listeners and a platform for companies to really talk about their sustainability progress. So this map pretty naturally came about just from our conversations with Jay and Scott and hearing about how you guys have structured the podcast and how you do it. We did a little bit of background research in order to kind of understand how sustainability defined is really unique. So we listen to a lot of other sustainability podcasts to really find sustainability defines really unique differentiating factors. So this map is one of the things, first things we made for you guys because it helped us understand your business model and it also helped us tailor our marketing strategy and let us visualize what you create, the value it brings to the market um, and provided a structure for us mm -hmm. to build the rest of our strategy off of. So it's, it's been great that you guys have been able to use it and it's been useful for you guys to reflect on your core skills and then what the podcast really offers. If our listeners are interested in it, can we share it? Or do you think this is something we should keep internal? Considering I just described it in quite a lot of detail. If listeners are interested, I think yeah. that's great. Okay, so listeners might also be interested in you know, they're they're like, oh, I want to learn more about how they created these things and learn more from Annabelle and Samantha. I guess one thing is how can they get in touch with you or follow you, but also what are your key pieces of advice if there are listeners in there who want to improve their personal brands, the brands they work with? How can they get in touch with you and what's your advice? Absolutely. You can find us both on LinkedIn. Um, we both have pages. Feel free to add us, send us a message, chat with us anytime. As far as advice goes, my biggest piece would be to be flexible. Um, your approach might have to shift if you're trying to create a brand or marketing strategy. Um, we changed up our strategy pretty significantly a few weeks into working with Jay and Scott. Um, we started out with these frameworks and tools like the core competency map that were helpful for building kind of the foundation and foundational understanding of sustainability defined and its value. 
But we shifted our strategy a lot to focus more on implementation just because that's what Jay and Scott were really wanting. So be flexible. Be ready to, yeah. to shift strategies. A couple of other things. Automated tools are super helpful. This is one of our biggest takeaways that you can actually use marketing to streamline a lot of processes that you may have in place but need a little tweaking. So for us, that was developing forms that could be embedded into the website. And then also, lastly, is working closely with partners. So in Sustainability Defiance case, that's you know those that you guys are interviewing on these efforts. So a recommendation to those that are interested in this is tag teaming with your partners to help each other communicate what the other is doing. And um, I think there's a lot of untapped opportunity that, to help each other reach a wider audience. Um, one thing <laughs> we wanted to mention was that Samantha uh -oh. was so dedicated to this project and making it work. She was at the beginning of the summer. This is something we've never told Jay and Scott. Oh. At the beginning of the summer, Samantha was absolutely determined to get Leonardo DiCaprio still secured as an interviewee or brand ambassador, something having to do with Leo. And so it's something we chatted about a few times in our first few meetings. Um, it didn't happen on our original original timeline, but we're, we, we haven't, haven't given up. Okay, <laughs> we haven't given up. There's still we still get Leo. We were yeah. there. <laughs> well, is, is this because you want him on the podcast or because you want to connect with him to talk with him and also ask him to be on the podcast? No, no, this, was a <laughs> this was a marketing strategy. Of we course. Want course. Brand awareness. We want you guys out there. <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll be honest. I was kind of expecting you to say Samantha was really considering getting her own sustainability defined tattoo, oh. which is still an option, Samantha. On the table. It's, uh -huh. it's, not off. it's not off the table. So I think we have to wrap this up, Jay, with our traditional last question. I mean, Edmond and Samantha, do you have any party facts on marketing or Duke University that you want to share with the listeners to wrap this up? Yeah, so most of my party facts have come from your podcast as a listener since 2016. <laughs> Samantha, let me follow this up. So you have these favorite party facts. Have you, and, and you're at Duke. Have you actually told them at a party? Yeah, of course. <laughs> oh, oh, did, did anyone drop their drink? In, in this in, environmental school bubble is uh, with like-minded individuals is more sustainability. <laughs> so you, you've, you've, actually, you've actually used it though, for real. I love that, yes. I mean, I'm very interested in, in food, specifically plant-based uh, meat. And so... One fun fact that I actually have told many people, including my family, who's probably tired of me telling them this. Mm -hmm. As a, a plant-based eater, so a vegan driving a big, hunkin', gasoline-guzzling car, you can actually have a much smaller carbon footprint than that of a Prius driving carnivore. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. I wonder how many vegans have big old cars. <laughs> Limited sample size. I mean, that way they can bring home more veggies. It's true. You can fit a lot of vegetables in a big old car. Well, on that note, Annabelle and Samantha, <laughs> I think we need to call it. Thank you. But seriously, thank you for all the time and attention and expertise you put into helping us out. We really do appreciate it. And thanks for joining the show. Thank you guys thanks so much. Having us, guys. It's been a blast. This has been really great. Thank you both. And as we wind our hodgepodge down, folks who listened through our last episode will remember us asking you, our listeners, to call in and let us know how you're pushing sustainability forward in your lives. Well, here's a great message we got from Dave in Colorado, who's certainly walking the talk. Have a listen and thank you so much, Dave. Hey, Scott and Jay, this is Dave from Aurora, Colorado. Love the podcast. Keep up the good work. Hey, I just wanted to let you guys know I took a major step towards reducing my carbon footprint this summer. I bought an EV, an all-electric EV. And I love it. And I also bought 43 solar panels in a solar collector. So what I'd like to tell my friends and family is that I drive a solar-powered car now. And they are all very impressed with that. Keep up the good work on the uh, podcast. Look forward to talking to you both soon. Thanks. All right, listeners, we're back. We've already opened our presents. There's really not much more for us to go through, but we do 
want to extend a very important round of thanks to our many researchers. Morgan Abbott, Adrian Breen, a.k.a. Scott's mother, Mm -hmm. Rishali Chaplot, and Shannon Parker for the awesome work they've done over 2019. We also want to thank our social media guru, Matt Aaron. So if you have seen our posts on Instagram or Facebook or LinkedIn, he's behind them, typically. So big shout out to him. And then we also want to thank so many people have reached out to us saying, we love this podcast. How can we help? You know, Jay and I, we only have so much time and there's only so much to do. We want to make sure that we give people meaningful experiences. But we want to thank you for reaching out and we're appreciative of that and also, those who have shared the podcast on social media, left iTunes reviews, thanks to any, anyone who's engaged beyond listening, which we also appreciate. We'd also like to thank Square Peg, Round Hole, and Potions, whose music we've been using since the very beginning, Scott. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have stuck true to the source. So, again, good jams throughout all of our episodes. Yeah, so listeners, we have exciting plans for 2020. I think we can tell him, Jay, that January is going to be on soil carbon, so keep an eye out for that episode. And remember, we're always here. You can give us feedback through the end of the year and at any point in 2020. Uh, It's hosts, H-O-S-T-S, at sustainabilitydefined.com. Okay, Jay, I think that about does it. You all stay sustainable out there. I'm Scott Breen. And I'm Jay Siegel. We will see you next year. Thank you.